Good afternoon. I'm Marvin Galhausen, Chair of the International Mother's Day Shrine Board of Trustees, and I'd like to welcome you to our 113th observance of Mother's Day. Here at the International Mother's Day Shrine, this is a National Historic Landmark, one of 16 in West Virginia, and it is where Mother's Day began. The first Mother's Day observance was May the 10th, 1908. Before we get into our service today, I'd like to give you a little of the background about Mother's Day and about this landmark structure. Anna Jarvis, the founder of Mother's Day, was born May the 1st, 1864. She was born just a few miles out the road from here at the shrine. However, within months of her birth, the Jarvis family moved into Grafton. Mr. Jarvis purchased a building for his mercantile business down along the Trobe Street. And the family lived above the business for the next 15 years. So Anna Grafton has this, the distinction of this being her childhood home, Grafton, the childhood home of the founder of Mother's Day. And Anna was educated in the Grafton Public Schools. Uh, she spent her early years here within Grafton. And even into her teenage years. And then she went off to college in Virginia and she returned to Grafton, educated as a school teacher. After 15 years along the Latrobe Street, the family moved to a beautiful home, just a street or two up the hill on, along Wilford Street. And that home was located adjacent to the Central High School. That is where Anna had graduated from high school and she returned to be a school teacher for several years there. The family continued to live in Grafton until Mr. Jarvis passed away on December the 31st, 1902. Mother Ann Reeves Jarvis, daughter Anna, another daughter Lillian, moved from Grafton to Philadelphia to be with Claude Jarvis, a brother of Anna's who had moved to Philadelphia and established a taxi cab business there. And Mrs. Jarvis had been the mother of at least 12 children. Historians somewhat disagree over how many children uh, were born to Mrs. Jarvis, but this was a time period when you recorded family births in the family Bible. And if you go back searching the genealogy, one of your main resources is the census reports. And so from those uh, documentations, we come that Mrs. Jarvis had at least 12 children. Unfortunately, only four of those children lived into adulthood. Uh, it would have been Anna, the founder of Mother's Day, her sister Logan, her brother Claude, and another bro brother, Josiah. Josiah became a physician, and he had a practice in Philippi, and then he moved his practice to Marion County. He is the only one of the four adult children who ever married, and he and his wife had one son. His son had three children, and only one of those three married, and so when the last daughter of that family died, the uh, Jarvis family lineage kind of stopped at that point. Uh, Anne Reeves Jarvis, the mother, she passed away on May the 9th, 1905, just a few years after the family had moved to Philadelphia. Standing at the foot of her mother's grave, daughter Anna remembered their little church here in Grafton. She had heard her mother throughout her lifetime uh, call for someone, sometime, somewhere to establish a day honoring mothers. And when Anna was 12 years old, her mother taught a Sunday school lesson on mothers of the Bible. And she ended that lesson with prayer, with that very call uh, for there to be creation of a Mother's Day. Daughter Anna would say that that burned into her mind and she could never forget that plea or that call from her mom. And so uh, after her mother's death, uh, she started making plans for uh, establishing a Mother's Day. And she really had pretty good success uh, 
right off the bat. In 1906, she had contacted the congregation here and they had a memorial service for her mother. And then the next year, they uh, had what we list as an unofficial Mother's Day service. And then by uh, that date, May the 10th, 1908, uh, Anna had everything in line and she had contacted the church here and she was very involved in the planning of the first official Mother's Day. Although she did not come back from Philadelphia, she stayed in Philadelphia, but she sent a telegram uh, explaining her goals for what Mother's Day should be and how it should be observed. And she sent carnations, which were her mother's favorite flower, uh, for distribution to the mothers that attended that first service. And some three to four hundred uh, were present for the first Mother's Day observance here. That afternoon in Philadelphia, uh, she had been successful in getting the backing of John Wanamaker, who had a large department store uh, in Philadelphia, and a second uh, observance in 1908 uh, was conducted there in Philadelphia, and some 15,000 showed up for that observance, and Anna Jarvis spoke at that. Uh, she had been influenced by the life of her mother, uh, who was very involved in uh, getting mothers together for mothers' uh, work clubs or mothers' friendship clubs, and those tackled some of the health issues at the time that were resulting in uh, so many infant deaths. And then during the Civil War years, uh, Mrs. Jarvis and her club members were involved in caring for the injured of both uh, Union and Confederate troops. And then once the Civil War ended, Mrs. Jarvis was very involved in trying to uh, reunite the community as West Virginia is the only state that was created uh, out of the Civil War. And by 1909, uh, the second official observance of Mother's Day, there were 45 states, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Canada, and Mexico, uh, that were involved in the observance and celebration of Mother's Day. In 1910, uh, the West Virginia governor issued one of the first proclamations for Mother's Day. And in 1911, the Jarvis Memorial Sunday School uh, was established. And in 1912, the Methodist Conference officially recognized the second Sunday in May as Mother's Day. And in 1914, the United States Congress uh, passed a resolution for the second Sunday in May to be Mother's Day, and President Woodrow Wilson uh, signed that resolution, and Mother's Day uh, was officially created and established. Uh, the Andrews Methodist Episcopal Church, here where the first service was held, uh, continued the observance of Mother's Day, and in the 1950s, uh, they merged with St. Paul's congregation and plans were initiated for a new church building and so they were going to move out of this building. And so in 1962, uh, community leaders realizing the historic significance of this structure uh, chartered and formed the International Mother's Day uh, Board of Trustees and the shrine was created to be a shrine for all mothers everywhere. And during that time period from 1962 through 1966, uh, both groups had a Mother's Day observance, the church in the morning and the nonprofit that had been formed in the afternoon. And then the church uh, moved from this facility in 1967. It was in 1992 that the National Park Service recognized this structure as a National Historic Landmark, one of 16 in West Virginia. Once again, let me welcome you to our 113th observance, and we will now enter into the observance itself. Welcome. Good morning on this Mother's Day. As we prepare our hearts and minds for today's worship, let us go to God in prayer. Dear Lord God, today and every day, we give thanks for mothers and mother figures we thank you for creating each one with a unique combination of gifts and talents. We thank you for the sacrifice of self, 
each one gives for others. We thank you for the gift of time with them. We thank you for their perseverance and their devotion. And most of all, Lord, on this day in which we honor mothers and mother figures, may we love and cherish the special women in our lives. We lift up all of these things as we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mother's Day, the very special day set aside each year to honor your mother, the best mother who ever lived, the mother of your heart, had its beginning in Grafton, Taylor County, West Virginia. Anna Jarvis dedicated her life to the establishment of Mother's Day, a day which was the inception of her own mother, Anne Reeves Jarvis, calling for someone, somewhere, sometime, to establish a special day for mothers. On the second Sunday in May, 1907, two years after the death of Anna Jarvis's mother, she arranged for friends in Grafton to hold a memorial service for her mother. On the same day in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, she invited friends to her home to share her vision of a new national holiday, Mother's Day. She began promoting her idea, and with her persistence, Andrews Methodist Episcopal Church of Grafton launched the annual observance of Mother's Day on Sunday, May 10, 1908. This first official service was held with leadership from Dr. Harry C. Howard, pastor, and Lawson L. Lohr, church school superintendent. During the first Mother's Day celebration held at Andrews Church, carnations, the favorite flower of Anne Reeves Jarvis, mother of the founder and the first honored mother of Mother's Day, were presented to those in attendance, a congregation of 407 persons. The second Sunday of May was proclaimed as Mother's Day as a result of the West Virginia State Proclamation issued on April 26, 1910, by West Virginia Governor William E. Glasgow. On May 8, 1914, the United States Congress, by adoption of a joint resolution endorsing the observance of Mother's Day, authorized the President to proclaim Mother's Day to be celebrated on the second Sunday of each May as a national holiday, celebrating the public expression of our love and reverence for the mothers of our country. The resolution was officially approved on May 9, 1914, by President Woodrow Wilson, making Mother's Day official nationwide. On May 15, 1962, the magnificent Andrews Church 
built in 1873, was declared to be the International Mother's Day Shrine, everlasting as an international shrine to all mothers and as a memorial to Anna Jarvis, founder of Mother's Day. Today, the Andrews Church Congregation is part of the Church of the Good Shepherd United Methodist of Grafton, the combined Andrews, St. Paul's, West Main Street, and St. John's Churches. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. A part of our annual Mother's Day service is the presentation of a Mother of the Year award. We take nominations for that, and our nominee this year is Martha Bennett. It's always good when you have someone who has been a part of the Grafton community and someone that we're somewhat familiar with. And so the uh, the nomination was presented and, and the board was very happy to uh, accept that nomination and I'm very honored that Mrs. Bennett decided to accept and uh, so we're glad that you all can be here for the presentation today. We often get asked if Anna Jarvis, the founder of Mother's Day, uh, how she would feel about the observance today. Uh, if you know the history of Mother's Day, you know that um, she was influenced by her mother to establish the day, and she spent several years uh, putting time and effort into that. Uh, once she got it established and recognized, there came a point in her life um, where she became very upset at various groups that were uh, deciding how to observe Mother's Day, especially organizations and clubs and all, rather than accept those and uh, be very happy that her day was taking root and expanding she almost viewed it as uh, a challenge to uh, what she viewed Mother's Day should be, and, and she almost wanted to micromanage uh, the observance of this day. So she got to the point where uh, she showed up at several of those clubs and organizations and basically challenged them for having a, a Mother's Day observance, and, and she got to the point where she was even arrested a time or two. And then uh, beyond that, she was very disturbed by uh, commercialization. She didn't like florist uh, selling uh, and making profit from families buying floral arrangements to, to present to their mothers. She didn't like people buying uh, printed cards. If you were going to make a card for your mother, you should could, should make a, a personal homemade card. Uh, that was uh, to her liking because she didn't like uh, printed. So she didn't like anyone making profit off of Mother's Day. 
and it got so bad that later in life uh, she actually initiated a petition drive to try and undo Mother's Day. Well, Mother's Day had taken uh, root internationally by that point, and uh, that effort was unsuccessful, but uh, it's kind of a sad story in some ways in that uh, she put so much time and effort into establishing the day and then being unhappy with it at the end of her life. But we're happy that the observance itself uh, took root and continued on. And so as we get asked today, you know, do you think Anna would be happy with that you're doing this or you're doing that? The one thing that we feel she would be completely happy with is that uh, we name and we honor her Mother of the Year. Uh, it falls right in line with uh, what she did in establishing the day itself and that uh, one of her main goals was to honor her own mother and we list Ann Reeves Garvis as uh, the first honored mother. Uh, last year when COVID hit then we had to kind of at the last minute scramble and, and change plans and so last year was the first observance of Mother's Day that the shrine here had that was a virtual online uh, presentation and we were hopeful that by this year we could have uh, more people in and, and have a regular traditional service and we hope to return to that next year uh, but at least this part of our service where we're honoring our mother of the year uh, we get to have uh, Martha and Chick and the entire family here with us and, and so we're very glad to actually have people in the building and, and to be uh, doing that phase of the presentation and the honor uh, it's In addition to that, uh, you know, that we've had several mothers of the year, and, and as I said, over the years, you know, sometimes you get one that's, that's from outside the community and, and that we're less familiar with. And uh, I appreciated Cheryl pulling together uh, the basic bio and all for the uh, uh, press release, we'll call it, that, that we sent out on Mother of the Year. And, and I learned uh, some things I didn't know about uh, uh, Martha, and I was thinking, you know, uh, she worked for the phone company, uh, one of those original Ma Bells, and, and I'm thinking, well, you know, this probably makes for a very interesting family story as, as you share it with uh, grandchildren and great-grandchildren in, in the, the years to come, and, and they're going to be looking at their cell phone going, what's a Ma Bell? And, you, know, you, had to, you had to talk to someone to make a phone call? <laughs> uh, but, but it'll make for a, a very interesting story in, in uh, coming years. Uh, but we were, uh, we were very pleased because uh, you can carry on that tradition even of Anne Reeves Jarvis of being involved in the community. Uh, we were very uh, pleased to have had you as a prior board member uh, of the Shrine uh, Board of Trustees. Uh, we appreciate your work in the community with the Arts Council and other entities and uh, your church work that you had done for a lot of years. And, and then, uh, as has been said, you know, you're, you're viewed as the matriarch of the uh, Bennett family. And we're sure that, you know, the, the main accomplishment and, and the main, and really the main thing that we honor today is your role as a mother. And uh, uh, the influence that you've been uh, with Chip to your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, uh, that is the true essence of Mother's Day, and, and that is what we honor today. Uh, so if you'll step up, I have a plaque, you know, as I said, we'll look at you the official one as soon as it comes in, but uh, 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 we have this to give you, if we'll uh, look towards the camera here. <laughs> there we go. And we also have behind you here a basket, uh, a gift basket. Oh, thank uh, you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. And then we printed off some copies of the certificates so that uh, each of the children uh, can have a copy too. Thanks. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. This is a great honor. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This particular day, is Mother's Day, and it is definitely a privilege to be worshiping with you from the historic International Mother's Day Shrine in downtown Grafton, West Virginia. 
Someone once said, life doesn't come with a manual, it comes with a mother. Every Mother's Day, we think about things that our mothers taught us, don't we? Here are some common things that our mothers might have taught us with a little bit of humor thrown in. My mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. She said, if you're gonna kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning. My mother taught me about religion. You better pray that that comes out of the carpet. My mother even taught me about time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you clear into the middle of next week. My mother taught me logic. Because I said so, that's why. My mother even taught me foresight. Make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident. My mother taught me about osmosis. Shut your mouth and eat your supper. My mother taught me how to become an adult. If you don't eat your vegetables, you'll never grow up. My mother even taught me about the weather when she said, your room looks like a tornado went through it. My mother taught me about anticipation. Just wait until we get home. My mother also taught me about medical science. If you don't stop crossing your eyes, they're going to freeze that way. And my personal favorite, my mother taught me about ESP. She said, put your sweater on. Don't you think I know when you're cold? These funny thoughts of things our mothers taught us remind me of the unknown author who said, sooner or later, we all quote our mothers. On a more serious note, there are always mixed emotions surrounding Mother's Day. This is a day when we recognize and honor women in our lives who have nurtured us and been a mother figure during our life's journey. These women might be our biological mothers, our adopted mothers, stepmothers, mothers-in-law, grandmothers, or even aunts and sisters, or an older friend, or even a father who's filling in for a mother. So we celebrate mother figures and we realize that they come to us in many shapes, in many forms, and many relationships. Many times the relationship between mother and children is wonderful, loving, and nurturing. Sometimes, though, due to life experiences, the relationship between a mother and children may be contentious and filled with anger or disappointment or bitterness for reasons of its own. It's a hard day for many of us because our mothers are already with Jesus and we miss them. It's a hard day for women who are struggling hard to become mothers and haven't been able to do that yet. So we acknowledge that for today, there are many emotions. We also acknowledge that there are no perfect mothers and no perfect children, and that in all our relationships, uh, we need for God to provide all of the grace that we can get to have a healthy relationship based on love. At its best, Mother's Day can be a grace-filled time and a time to let go of some memories and a time to hold tight to other memories. Speaking about a mother-child relationship, Richard Kipling said, God could not be everywhere and therefore he made mothers. Relating love to the characteristics of mothers and mother figures, there's a story about a woman who always critiqued the preacher's sermon. One morning after worship, 
she said, great sermon. I'm so glad that you preached straight from the Bible because I was getting sick and tired of hearing about love all the time. Well, I'm afraid she wouldn't think much of my sermon today because in honor of mothers and mother figures, my sermon is all about love. I invite you to hear with me a passage from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 12. As the Father has loved you, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. May God bless our understanding of the scripture that we've heard from the Gospel of John. There are many passages from the Bible that speak about love. And the one that we heard from John 15, 9 through 12, is one that talks about the kind of love that we should try to practice. Jesus seemed serious about this love thing. In the passage we shared from John, Jesus used the word love seven times in just four verses. This passage is part of Jesus' farewell address, so it's important for us to think carefully about what the passage says to us. These words are the ones that Jesus used right before he went out into the night to be arrested and crucified. You see, the church had been having trouble determining the difference between legalism and love. So Jesus made an effort on his last night with his disciples to help them sort out what was the most important thing in life. Jesus encouraged the disciples to abide in or stay in his love, to remain with him or to make themselves at home in his love by keeping his commandments. Actually, he made it very simple for them. He condensed all of the rules that were confusing into one by commanding the disciples to love one another as I have loved you. Now, some people have issues with commandments. I don't because it takes the guesswork out of how we're supposed to behave. When Jesus made this statement, he really meant for the disciples to look at each other and others they met, and despite all the differences that they saw in backgrounds, religious beliefs, occupations, personalities, and values, to unconditionally love that other person just as much as he has showed his love for them. In this passage, the relationship that Jesus had with the disciples had moved to a new and deeper relationship than it had ever been. It had moved past the master-servant stage, and they had become friends. In fact, you'll notice that Jesus never calls them slaves or disciples, just friends. Interestingly enough, someone once said that your mother is your first friend, your best friend, and your forever friend. Jesus talked about and modeled a special kind of love. It was unconditional love. It was a sacrificial love. It was a love that overlooked all kinds of flaws. It was an unselfish love. It was a personal love. I think that even children seem to understand that this is a difficult kind of love to practice. 
I heard a story this week that you may have heard about a mother who was preparing pancakes on Saturday morning for her kids, and her sons were five and three years old. As many of us can understand, the two boys began to argue about who would get that first pancake. Mom saw the opportunity for a teaching moment about loving and sharing, so she said, now remember, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Well, the five-year-old thought about it for a few seconds, and then he said to his brother, Ryan, you be Jesus. That Jesus love isn't easy to practice, and we all have to be intentional about it. Sometimes I wonder what our daily lives would look like if we simply tried to love each other using that love that Jesus shared. What if we tried this at home or at work or at school or in the car or during meetings with our neighbors, with our children, with our parents, with our siblings, with our spouses, at the dinner table, when texting or talking on the phone, even with social media, what if we tried to show the kind of love that Jesus expected? If we really want to seek deeper, more meaningful relationships, we need to try to love each other as Jesus commanded. Loving one another takes care of a lot of things in a relationship. Loving one another takes away the need to be competitive or the need to always be right. Loving one another takes away the need to be in control. Loving one another can even take away the idea that we need to use words. Loving one another allows us to put that other person first. Loving one another allows us to be friends despite our differences. To love one another as Jesus loves us, we have to be ready and willing to love with no strings attached, no conditions, without our fingers crossed behind our back, hoping that we'll be loved too. To love as Jesus loves us, we have to be ready and willing to put aside our grudges, our hurt feelings, our fears, our judgmental nature, our anger, our disappointments. Jesus simply said, you are to love one another. No exceptions, no excuses, no conditions. I think that Jesus would be happy wearing a t-shirt that I saw recently that said, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. It's all about love from the moment we are born until the moment we leave life. We are hardwired to love. We are created to love. And if everybody in the world could figure out a way to love one another in the sense that Jesus meant, there would be no problems, no wars, no hunger, no homeless people, no abusive relationships, no angry words, no misunderstandings, no lonely people. I think that mothers are supposed to be hardwired to love unconditionally as well. In fact, E.M. Forrester commented on the strength and the fierceness of love that mothers have by saying, I am sure that if the mothers of various nations could just meet together, there would be no more wars. It's Mother's Day, and mothers are a symbol of love. Let's try to honor our mothers and women who have been like mothers to us by trying to love one another, just as Jesus commanded us to do. Amen.
open the service by sharing with you a timeline of significant events from the first observance in 1908. Now, before we close, let's take a moment and look at the present and the future. For the past few years, our main project has been the restoration of the beautiful leaded stained glass windows within this National Historic Landmark. There are 27 windows. I am happy to report that all six windows on the east side of the sanctuary have been restored. One window on the west side of the sanctuary has been restored, and two more have been removed and are currently at William Stained Glass in Pittsburgh and going through the re restoration process. It costs roughly $15,000 per window for the full restoration. If this is something that you would like to contribute to, contribute to you can visit our website, internationalmotherstayshrine.org, and by using PayPal, you can send us your gift. Or you can send us a check, mail it to International Mother's Day Shrine, Post Office Box 513, Grafton, West Virginia, 26354. I thank you for listening to our Mother's Day observance here for Mother's Day Began. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I wish every mother everywhere a very happy Mother's Day. We look forward to seeing you again next year or to you visiting any time that you can. Be safe, happy Mother's Day, and God bless. Thank you for joining us today on this Mother's Day, and as we get ready to go our separate ways and begin a new week, let us go to God in prayer. Today, brothers and sisters, may the Lord strengthen us for the Christian life. May the Lord, who provides for all our needs, sustain us day by day. May the Lord, whose steadfast love is constant as a mother's care, send us out to live and work for others. And may the blessing of God be with us and remain with us always. Amen.